that's not as dangerous as I thought it would look like. When the three founders assemble, they form a headless one-armed Voltron. Not ideal, but good enough for a podcast. Founder Quest. Yeah, it's called a whirly board. It's like a local, well, not local. It's a U.S. like small business, um, apparently, that makes them. I forget what where they're located, not in Washington. But yeah, it's like a skateboard. There's I've seen other balance boards that are like, made for standing desks but none of them have the uh this has like also like side like you can balance on the edges of it as well so you can kind of rock back and forth between the outer edges and balance oh that's really cool you can apparently you can do uh tricks you can you can do like 360 of course you can and, uh yeah so you can ollie I was imagining literally like a skateboard on top of an exercise ball where if you like lost your balance, it would just like fly out from underneath you. Yeah, this is not like, yeah, not, not a, not a, one of the big exercise balls. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the big ones. <laughs> no. There, you probably wouldn't have enough ceiling in your room to, the ceiling wouldn't be Yeah, high to, it would not be. <laughs> well, that's cool. So that's supposed to like work out your core or something or give you better balance. I, yeah, I think all of the above. I more just got it to give myself something to do while I'm standing. It's kind of fun. Like, you know, it's, it's like a sport you can do while working at your desk. Oh, that's cool. Sometimes at my standing desk, I find that, yeah, like I'm fine. I find that I'm like standing, but I'm like standing in this very like rigid like way. Yeah. And this, I have to remind myself to not do that. So maybe yeah, this stops, maybe that would help. This definitely stops you from doing that. You have to, um, and I like, I think this one is like very, it's not stable at all. So, it's probably on the more unstable end of the options out there. I was trying to like work that into like a, a sick burn against like, I don't know, node or something, but <laughs> I, <laughs> it's in there somewhere. Like I, I just couldn't do it in time. I'm a little bit tired. Yeah. I feel you. I'm a little bit tired. I Thursday, I took the day off and drove down to San Francisco. It was a 13 hour drive. And then Pretty I had a, an appointment. Yeah, I had an appointment, came back the next day in another 13 hour drive That's... and I didn't really sleep very well. So uh, honestly, like it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. It was very long, but mm -hmm. it's like I've done I've done that before. You know, it's about the same distance from like the bottom of Texas to Guadalajara, which I've driven several times. Yeah. And like, it's not too know, bad. It's it, it's boring and you feel like like mush. You feel like oatmeal after the end of it. But <laughs> yeah. Get like a good audio yeah. book or podcast or something. Yeah. I mean, our and podcast doesn't work well for this, um, for long road trips because our episodes are like 30 minutes, but you want something like hardcore history That's, or something. I just binged our own podcast the whole way down there. <laughs> just I just binged it. So you binged so it on bingeable. the way down and then you binged it again on the way back. <laughs> My biggest tra travel like tip that I, uh, something I did different this time and it really probably only works. I mean, maybe you could swing this if you're flying, but I, I mean, the reason I drove instead of just like taking an easy one hour flight is that like, I don't want to die. And that seemed to be like the less lethal option at this point. So yeah, so I was able to like take my yoga mat and like, I don't do really complex yoga, but just like, ha like having this sort of ability to kind of like stretch after like I arrive at a place after driving many hours and, you know. Like it, I, I feel much less just like pretzel, pretzelified than yeah. I normally would. I think after a trip like that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Just go, you, did you go down like by the Golden Gate Bridge and just like out on the beach and stretch at dawn, do some yoga at dawn on the <laughs> I'll on let the you front. imagine that. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> image. I'll let all of our listeners imagine that, <laughs> that I have that kind of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done that drive um, more times than I probably should have. But, um, do you mind if I cross, if I like, uh, cross promote my Insta on here? I'm, I don't, I'm just yeah. kidding. I don't, I don't have an Insta. Your lifestyle, uh, your lifestyle influencer. My lifestyle Insta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so yeah. What are we talking about today? Well, so I was just thinking about a security in the context of our compliance work, which thankfully is just about wrapped up. I checked on the auditor portal this morning and all of the evidences have been accepted. So now Yay. it's just, I think, yeah, I think it's just uh, getting the final report written is the only thing left for them to do. So you knocked those out fast, Ben. 
Well, you know, it only took what several months of preparation to get to that point. So. Yeah. But, but the last couple Fast. of weeks, it seems like you're, you're like, yeah, they gave me like a list of, another list of like 40 things that we have to do. And I'll, I'll maybe, you know, get to them over the next couple of months and then like a whole week of <laughs> you doing <laughs> things and then it's, it's ready. Yeah, you posted like a screenshot and it was like, <laughs> like it was all gamified. It looked like Xbox achievements oh, right. or something. Are you, are you going for HIPAA now? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I so want to. So it's a, if you have to envision this since you're listening to this podcast, but imagine a dashboard that shows you a um, circle charts for completion. So what we're working on, what we've been working on, the compliance is SOC 2. And on, on our dashboard for the auditor's tool, their web-based tool they use to track all the stuff, there is a little circle chart that shows you how completion, how, what your completion is towards your goal of getting SOC 2 compliance. Well, next to that chart are other charts that show you what your progression is towards other compliance games that you could use, like HIPAA or ISO 27001. And uh, it's totally game mechanics, psychological kind of thing where they're like, hey, look how close you are to this other thing that you could also do and <laughs> spend a lot more money and time to get compliance certified for. And just yeah. made me twitch because I'm I'm totally I'm totally a sucker for that sort of thing. Like, oh, I could get that, and I could get that, and yeah, it was it's it's been rough. Like I have to resist the urge to double down and do HIPAA and other things like that. Yeah, how does um I mean like does SOC affect like if if a someone if a medical business needed to use us that needed something I don't know does it help us at all in the medical field or or do we need to go for HIPAA if we're going to uh to deal with that. It's, so, you know, HIPAA, HIPAA like SOC, there's not like a checklist of yeah. things, right? There, there's it's a bunch of guidelines and you need to assure an auditor and your customers that you, you adhere to certain, you know, practices and mm -hmm. procedures that make you a secure organization. So there is a lot of overlap. So like the, our, for example, that percentage goal thing that they showed in the, in the dashboard, like when it was showing uh, SOC 2 is 87% complete, it was showing HIPAA at 82% complete. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there is a lot of overlap there. Right. Um, but the way that typically I think we will handle that in, instead of just going for a full HIPAA certification from an auditor is we'll just, you know, we'll sign the business associate agreements that HIPAA compliant customers want to use. In which we assure them that yes, we're we're doing those things. But yeah, we gotcha. can definitely point at the SOC two report and say, yep, yeah, this is a uh, our auditor says we're doing stuff that makes us secure, so you can trust us. Yeah. Right, and that would having the SOC two would probably um, add weight to our statements of like that we're right. complying with other things. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. it's, not, it's not just a pinky swear kind of thing. It's like, yeah, this is legit, verified. Right, yeah. it's kind of funny because we uh, just this. A couple weeks, we were a couple weeks ago. I was looking at using a a new vendor, and as part of our compliance, now we have to go and make sure that our vendors are also following security best practices. And that means I have to get some sort of report or attestation from them. I sent an inquiry to one of our vendor, a potential vendor, and said, "Hey, can you send me a SOC two report, or can you send me some sort of attestation?" And they're like, "Sure." And they, they sent me a bunch of their policies. I'm like, oh, yeah, I recognize these policies because yeah. they're the same ones that I wrote. And then my next thought was, but how do I know that you're following these policies? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it's just, it's just kind of silly. Yeah, we're, we're like on the other side of this now because now you've been going to try to make sure our vendors are complying with the things that we need to comply with and they're giving you the runaround, right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, it's been great. The shoe <laughs> is on the other foot. <laughs> You know, yep. the funny thing about all this, I feel, is that, you know, based on my limited understanding, is that corporate regulation by, by the government and sort of like the punishments um, that co companies get and people inside of companies get for sort of white collar crime, malpractice, malfeasance and stuff is like so just BS. And yeah, basically, like companies never get punished for doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just like, I'm imagine like we have these huge, like we're creating these huge chains of liability. And then at the end of the day, it's, you know, I mean, not for us, um, we would probably get, get screwed <laughs> if, we, if we got well, sued by yeah. somebody. So we're not, we're not, um, we're not like Exxon. Yeah. If Exxon or Facebook or somebody gets, gets sued by somebody, like nothing really bad is going to happen to them as a result. Yeah. So I don't know. If you can tolerate the lawsuit, you probably don't care. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. So one of the fun things that came out of the compliance work, though, was security testing. So one of the things that they ask for is, have you done a penetration test in the past year? And uh, prior to this, we had not done a penetration test, primarily because they're darn expensive, really, really expensive. But it turns out that it was a really interesting exercise. So we contacted a firm who does uh, has experience with testing Rails applications in particular. And I, again, this is the first time I had gone through it. So I was surprised to, as we were onboarding with them, they gave us some options on what kind of testing we would like to have. And, and one of the options was just plain old, like they have no information, they just go in blind and, and try and, and mess up your system. But another option that I hadn't really considered before was they can get access to your code ahead of time and they'll do a deep dive review of your code and look for vulnerabilities and then use that information to inform their testing so more of a targeted kind of thing and allows them to optimize the time spent on the engagement and so we went with that option and it was it was really good like i was well pleasantly surprised that we did not have a significant list of issues to deal with we did have some some that i was like oh yeah i could see that and some i was like wow where'd that come from that that's Mm -hmm. that was out of that field So it was really useful for me to have that. And after having fixed a few of those things, now I'm like, oh, I'm feeling pretty good, you know? (laughs) Feeling secure? Feeling secure. (laughs) We've gotten some of like the outside, uh, like vulnerability testing and scanning for free a little bit or for, you know, like the price of a bounty here and there. Um, Yeah. I mean, we didn't ask, we didn't ask for it, but... (laughs) That, yeah, I'm sure that helped a little bit because we fixed a few things that people reported over the years. And so yeah. maybe I should maybe I should explain about this because this was all a surprise to me whenever this started happening. So I imagine it might be a surprise to listeners who don't. You mean when you, you get know, big enough, to, to you get big enough to attract the attention of security researchers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I guess they have their lists or something, and <laughs> you get put on a list of uh, SaaS companies yeah. or whatever. And someone then, gives out your phone uh, number. <laughs> yeah, somebody gives out your phone number. They Then suddenly you have thousands of people from all over the world trying to break into your site. with. And usually they, they use these automated tools that spit out sort of automated reports. And you can kind of tell that nobody's really spent significant time in this. And you know, you'll get these emails from their automated systems, which are like, oh, you need to do this or blah, blah, blah. And you know, sometimes... Like sometimes they're valid things. A lot of times they're like, oh, okay, like that's, I guess you're technically right, but that's not yeah, really it's reaching practically <laughs> an issue. And they're, you know, and they're just like, they ask for money. Basically they ask for tips. They're like buskers, aren't they? <laughs> they're like security buskers. The buskers of yeah. the tech industry. <laughs> yeah, I totally remember like the first few we got of those and people were like, so do you pay bounties for bug reports? Or like, uh, no. Why would we do that? You know? <laughs> uh, and, I, and I totally felt like, are, is that a threat? You know, are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's really not. Like after having dealt mm-hmm. with several of these, it's, it's really not. They're just, they are, there are plenty of bug bounty programs out there that do pay, you know, I- anywhere from like tip money up to really big money. Yeah, pretty well. And uh, yeah, they're just looking for, in our case, once, once we, because we always tell people, nope, we don't do bug bounties, but they still like to get the recognition. And so they'll ask for uh, like a acknowledgement on our website, which we do. And they also ask for like a t-shirt or some sort of swag, which we, we're happy to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's kind of yeah. cool. Like it's, it's like, it's kind of like a frontier of the, uh, of the industry. Like you, you go into it, you're not necessarily going to get anything out of it, but if you're, you have to be good enough. And if you discover, you know, the, the like the right bug, you might uh, strike it rich. Right. Yeah. It is very, it does have very sort of like cyberpunk <laughs> feels to it. Yeah. I think you might die of dysentery along the way, but yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, it makes sense to me that we all felt a little bit threatened by it because like all the, the security stuff, just like, like the bug bounty people just came in one giant wave <laughs> and none of us expected it. And we were all just scrambling and you know, what's happening. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I think we got listed on one of their sites or something. Cause there's sites that list like companies that like on bounty programs and things. And I don't know how we would have made it on one of those, but I assume like since it all came at once, we must have got gotten listed somewhere. Yeah. I may have mentioned this before on the podcast, but we are also now on a list of companies that like buy content. And so <laughs> yeah. we get spammed by every single person selling any kind of content 
online, whether or not it has anything to do with us or our business. And yeah, but, but, but yeah. thankfully, Help Scout has automated rules so that we can filter all those messages directly to Star. <laughs> yeah, they just all come great straight to me. It's wonderful. And I just send them straight to spam. Yeah. <laughs> I've considered just sending them straight to spam because you know what? In our Write For Us page, it doesn't say to contact Honey Badger support. It says to contact a different email address. And if you're yep. contacting Honey Badger support, you clearly are using a scraped thing because you just like scrape the support web, the support email yeah. address some, from somewhere else on the website, it's not right. in the Write For Us page. Yeah, I don't know. It's even better when, when they use email addresses from our documentation that just happen to be the names from the Princess Bride characters. <laughs> And it's uh -huh. like, oh, you emailed us at Amigo <laughs> at Honey Badger. Yeah, I happen to know where you got that email address. Yeah. <laughs> That's really clever. I didn't know that, um, I didn't know there was a, a schema there. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> That's so fun. Ben's got a schema for everything. But I, yeah. I love how the security researchers are doing it for street cred a lot of times. So what yeah. they'll do is they'll, they'll get your swag. And when they receive it in the mail, then they'll post a picture of it to Twitter and brag to all their friends like, hey, I got the I got this thing from Honey Badger yeah. because I found this vulnerability. I, I just think it's, total, think it's awesome. a total like glory for glory and honor thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not going to pay you for a bug report, but I'll happily send you a shirt so you can brag about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we pay people? I don't know. We've that, given, we know, do I, give them swag and stuff. Yeah, I think there's rationale for that. And I think it makes sense. So I'm not going to say it's it's a, something that you shouldn't do, but uh, as a small business, it's kind of tough to justify, you know, what what's the right price, you know, and then you get into the incentive thing, and yeah, it's just yeah. kind of a hairy question. I think yeah. like the recognition, at least, like having our, we have that security page where we we list them. Yep, is a, at least a nice thing to do if you're small. I wonder, like, if we did start paying people, if we would start getting like so many more people trying to find bugs and submitting bugs and stuff that we would just sort of be overwhelmed by sort of spam. I mean, not really spam, but you know, mm -hmm. by all these things that we don't really, there aren't really that, I don't know, like by people just trying to make a buck. I don't know. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the weak areas too, is like, because like you mentioned, they'll report things like, it's just like, ah, okay, I can see technically that's true, but we just don't care. Like, it's not a big deal. And it would be nice if we had like a, won't fix listing, right? Like, okay, just don't even bother submitting a report because we've gotten this report five times. Mm -hmm. and we just don't care about that oh, particular yeah. thing, right? We'll put that on our security page. Yeah, good. Just hashtag won't fix. <laughs> hashtag That's our security fix. messaging. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. like I should make it clear that like we don't, if we didn't care about something, it's because it doesn't really have an effect on our users, not because we're just negligent. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there's, and, and back to like the, the, penetration tests, there are different severities of issues, right? There are critical issues. There are a high priority, then medium and low, and then just informational, right? And so yeah. the, the things that we consider won't fix are either informational or low, right? Like some low things just don't matter. Yeah. But if anyone files a, you know, a, a critical, of course, we're going to, you know, hop on that right away and fix it. For example, like the one that I, that I thought of, when I mentioned that we had a bit of a head start, thanks to the security researchers, is like uh, didn't one of the things they raised like really early on was like a brute force issue on our login page, where if you if you don't throttle request to your login page, like people can just basically submit it over and over, and um, like I you know maybe your hash uh, your uh, password hashing algorithm. I think there's like some cryptography stuff that can limit those attacks a little bit, but still you you want to like throttle request to that page, right? And that would, I think I noticed that that was something that the pen testers checked for and we passed on. So we would mm -hmm. have had to deal with that if that were, if that were an issue. Yeah. Another favorite one that we have changed over time as a result of the a number of reports from security researchers are things around email addresses and confirmations. Like someone said, oh, if you, if you change your email address in the app, then it should notify you at, at the old email address and at the new email mm -hmm. address to confirm that you actually want to make that change. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a totally reasonable thing. And so we went ahead and did that. Um, so it's definitely useful to have these people out there doing that for basically the cost of a t-shirt. That's, I mean, it's really nice. Yeah. Especially at the, at the price tag of uh, paying people to do it, apparently. Yeah, because a penetration test, the real <laughs> deal is definitely much more expensive than a t-shirt. Like what order of magnitude are we talking? Like what? What's the rough range? I, we don't have to say exactly how much. I, mean, I don't even know if we can say how much we paid, but like... yeah. 
I mean, I don't like care sharing numbers. tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, <laughs> millions. Do we pay millions of dollars? Is it a revenue, a revenue millions. share, like a revenue share <laughs> yeah. deal? <laughs> yeah. It's less, less than a hundred thousand dollars in our case. <laughs> okay. Are my kids going to be able to go to college still, Ben? <laughs> uh, well, actually maybe not for other reasons, but. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, like I said, I'm really glad that we had that done. There, there were some, I think there were three issues. Two of the, one of them was just like, okay, you have to have insider knowledge to exploit this. But if you had that insider knowledge, then you could be really nasty. So, so mm-hmm. that one like, is, it was high, but okay, it's mitigated. We fixed it anyway. But two of them were like, oh, wow, that's really a thing. And I'm actually kind of surprised that no one in all their testing has found you know, one of those. One of them was a cross-site scripting issue which was embedded in our markdown parser. So thank you, Star, for giving me the quick fix on that one. But basically, we, we had neglected to use one option flag to the renderer that turned off basically cross-site scripting. It's like, oh, you should probably make that the default, right? <laughs> it's not the default? <laughs> it's not the default. Uh-huh. No. And I didn't know this, but in markdown, if you use, if you use the red carpet markdown rendering gem, it, you can put like JavaScript links in there. You know, yeah. where instead of okay. the, um, the, the um, URL, you can put, you know, JavaScript colon and then whatever your JavaScript is. Sounds like a yeah. and nice, it'll, great it'll, feature. I know. It's like, that's <laughs> just, you want your authors to be able to have that capability for markdown. That's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I guess the, the lesson is like for, yeah, for markdown, always use the most, always just turn on safe links or whatever it's called. I don't know. Well, except yeah. in, in JavaScript land where that is becoming the, the thing is you can kind of mix the two. You know, and if you're building like a front end site, you do maybe want to put like a React component in your markdown for whatever reason, believe it or not. <laughs> so, Those people are going straight to hell, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> this, there's no redemption for them. Now use Facebook's proprietary like markdown in JavaScript. Well, you got to, to, to write your blog posts. You got to use the BB code, right? Remember those BB code tags? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. I just use wow. straight ASCII codes. I just oh. um So that reminds or me actually, ANSI codes. <laughs> last week, last week we were uh we were talking about the old school internet stuff, right? Yeah. BBSs before the internet and then forums on the internet. Mm-hmm. And uh no lie, I ended up on a PHP BB forum <laughs> over the weekend. Someone nice. sent a link. They were reading up on kayaks and they linked to a kayak forum that was hosted. Yeah. Was like, wow, blast from the past. That's, I've noticed like the ones that are still around are like those old school, like those like non tech, like non tech focused communities, you know, like there's mm-hmm. one for, uh, for like Jeeps too. Like, uh, cause I have a Jeep Wrangler and I've, I've looked up stuff for like Jeep parts and stuff. And there's like all kinds of old school forums about, about Jeeps out there. Yeah. So they still exist. They're still, they're still, uh, Still, Still serving pink. their purpose, yeah. Still rendering those BB code tags. I wonder what their pen tests look like. I mean, for us. Well, I mean, like we could have our, our Honey Badger, our Founder Quest community could be a PHP BB. You don't, we don't, hey. why do we need, why do we need a whatever discourse or what, like, what does it have to be fancy, you know? <laughs> it gets the job done. <laughs> no, I'm, it needs to be a dial up BBS, Josh. We need to have a house full of desktop computers. <laughs> yeah, we should, yeah, we should do that. But then we'd have to argue over which BBS software to run because I'd be all for World War Four. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if we can I remember, uh, handle oh. that <laughs> as a company. <laughs> and then and then I wouldn't get any work done because I'd be playing trade wars all day long. It sounds like an okay life though. Yeah, I guess. When I don't know if it was the well or if it was some other like big big BBS. Like they like you had your normal BBSs that were like local and then you had your BBSs that I think people had to pay to get into and like you attracted more of a internet or national sort of following. I don't know. Or maybe they were in big cities. And I saw like a a magazine interview with one of these people like a long time ago. And they had a picture of like their house and it was just like full of desktop computers like all running instead of I don't know, maybe they didn't know about like rackable servers or maybe they just didn't have them or didn't i i don't I couldn't afford them who knows but the, it was a whole house full of desktop computers i remember thinking that was so cool because sure. i didn't know about rackable servers either <laughs> well one other thing that came out of the uh compliance work the penetration test was realizing that and part of our 
pull review requests, our pull request reviews, that we should be looking at the security checklist as well. Like, you know, we, we check for code quality naturally and functionality, of course, but also having a checklist of like the top 10 kind of vulnerabilities that you should keep in mind, like for in particular, the OWASP top 10. And uh, Josh helped me out on that one. He created a little template for our pull requests in our repo. So now, right when you look at the pull request, there's a list of all the top 10 things you should be looking for, like cross-site scripting or those other yeah. Oh, nice. SQL injection. It's great. It's just when, every time you're opening a pull request now, it's just like you have a guy in a suit and tie bending over your shoulder and kind of, you know, don't forget like, the security. Tap, tap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> uh, I guess with the, the, the issue with the markdown, we would have like seen that checklist, been like, oh, like maybe I should try inserting yeah. some malicious stuff. Like, I'm not even sure that like I would have caught that though, even like if I had been checking for it, because I wouldn't have honestly, like I never make JavaScript links. I wouldn't have even considered like thought about making a JavaScript link. Yeah. I might have tried inserting like a JavaScript tag mm -hmm. and seeing if it got stripped out and um, which it would have. But yeah, so I, I yes. don't know, maybe, maybe we also need like some, like a list of just like a, a test post, <laughs> like, <laughs> like has all the, the possible like cross site things, all the possible SQL injection things. And just like, it's like, you have to try posting this into any form that you make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or hire a dedicated security person. That's what they do all day long is mess with your stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe this list, uh, and the pull request template will start to help us like internalize some of these security things to look for. Cause I don't know about you all, but like really the main one that I always, that I might actually spot is usually like the SQL injection stuff. Cause I've been like my, I think my brain has been trained to think about like looking for places where input is coming in from the outside world. And so that's already like I, that must be like a pattern that I'm already trained to look for. So maybe having the list of all the other things that you could potentially look for will over time help us to uh, look, you know, spot them more uh, automatically. Yeah. yeah, that's a good thought. Mm -hmm. On that note, we also started using Breakman yes. more regularly. <laughs> or, in, or you could hire work. a robot. <laughs> <laughs> or hire a robot. And yeah. uh, Breakman's really good about finding like SQL injections right. and, and things like that. Go figure. So it does Breakman all this stuff. Like that, a, yeah, all the stuff that's easy Breakman's for humans to a, do. It's an automated like pen test tool. It's a static analysis tool. Yeah. So it, it takes a look at your code. It reads the code and, it, and matches it to patterns that it knows could lead to vulnerabilities and then flags code and says, hey, you should probably take a look at this and see. Like it, it will look for SQL injections. Like it'll look for um, interpreted strings inside of a query. For okay. Example. Now that might not be an actual SQL injection because you might control that that string, right? It may not be user input, but so it's not not necessarily one hundred percent accurate. But it gives you a good check as to like, hey, this is a concern. You might want to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Kind of make a list and then flag them, flag them off. As yeah, yeah. And by the way, that's one of those things that's on the check boxes of all those compliance questionnaires, the security questionnaires that you get. Do you use static analysis on your code base? So yeah. oh, nice. nice. If you use Breakman, you can check that off. So right now we're we're trialing both just a GitHub action that runs Breakman, which is an open source tool. So you can just uh, it's like a command line thing, but you can put in your CI and uh, works kind of like a linter. So it'll fail if it finds an issue. So we're testing just a plain GitHub action, and then we're also testing Code Climate, which um, has an integration that basically like runs Breakman for you, and then gives you a little UI on top of it that gives you that like false positive list. Like you could check it off as a false positive, or you could check it off as like, this was an issue that I fixed. It's really, it's just a UI on top of Breakman, I think, but so we'll see. And is which... Breakman only for Rails apps? I believe so. Well, it's is Ruby. It... Yeah, it it's is, Ruby. Yeah. yeah. It's for Ruby. I was yeah. just, um, I asked about Rails just because it's like a break is a part of a train and like, like Rails things tend to be sort uh -huh. of like locomotive <laughs> yeah. themed. Yeah. I think you're onto something yeah. there. It's, it's definitely focused on Rails, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And then to, to top off the security stack, we also, for a long time, have been using uh, Detectify, which is an automated web penetration tool. So it's not, not as sophisticated as an actual human going in and doing penetration tests, but it's, uh, it does a lot of common things. It tries to attack your web app with 
SQL injection and, and fuzzing and all that kind of fun stuff. And we run that every week and it usually reports nothing, you know, but every now and yeah. then it says, oh, you should fix this little thing or you might want to add this header kind of stuff. What about uh, Collide? That's, that's not for, for, for websites, but it's a security thing we implemented, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that, Josh. Well, you know more about it than I do, but um, <laughs> basically it's like a, like a root kit I installed on my computer <laughs> that tell, <laughs> tells me if I've misconfigured something <laughs> security wise. So you, I, I think from like my perspective, I give it ultimate trust and then it, uh, it helps protect me from myself. Yeah. The thing that, the thing I like about <laughs> Collide is that uh, not only does it monitor those things, like are yeah. you using full disk encryption? Do you have your if, firewall turned if on? If you have like an unprotect, an unencrypted uh, SSH key was a cool one. Yeah. So a lot of those things like you don't think about all, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then it reports that stuff to Slack. And so <laughs> it shame and shames you. <laughs> <laughs> it shames you. It's like, Hey, <laughs> pay attention. So. My, my only beef with it is that it ends up making me update my, my Mac a little faster than I would otherwise. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to reboot. And so, but it's like, nope, you haven't applied the patches. You better do that. And it, yeah, so I know, I know you can't handle it. You can't handle just letting it ride. So you have to I do can. it immediately. I'll, I'll let it, I'll leave it until <laughs> the end of the day or whatever. Just like, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I've been impressed with Collide. Like I was a little bit nervous installing it. It feels weird. Just like, I mean, I don't know people at Collide, they could do whatever they want to my computer now, but yeah, like it really is very thorough. Like I had, um, you know how like GitHub has, like it lets you download a file with some like recovery keys for your um, two, two factor authentication. I had forgotten to delete it after I printed it out and it had gotten, it was basically like two years old sitting in the, like my downloads folder or something. And it found that it found like a couple of them because I had like, you know, because like when I transferred computers, I just like took my whole desktop and put it in like, I don't know, some shared thing, copied it over. And then so I've got like these things littered all over my di my disk going like several years back and I didn't even know about it. So, yeah, that was I was I was kind of impressed by that. And then it's like, oh, it's, it's reading everything. It knows everything about me. It's like what like what what else does it know about me? <laughs> Is it is it copying my journal entries? <laughs> this is why you have a personal computer. <laughs> yeah, it's cool stuff. But the the best part about the whole compliance process was all the things that I got to say do not apply to us, like you know physical security and filing cabinets and uh, guests coming to your office. It's like oh yeah, we are all work from home. Doesn't apply. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. <laughs> Skipped all that. So that was nice. So. I think that that completes our security posture. We got the penetration tests, we got the automated tests, we got the checklist that we're going to use in our PRs, and we got Collide watching our laptops. It's, we've got firewalls. We've got, yeah. And of course, like our production is just like locked, super yeah. locked down, right? Yeah, there's production stuff we had to add too. Security groups and VPCs, <laughs> and it's just, yeah, it's fun. All, all the fun intrusion, things we should run running us as intrusion detection. Oh, yeah, we've got yeah. that now too. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we have a tool now that's watching for file changes and yeah, and intrusion detection. Like I don't know how it does it. It's like magic. I don't know, but uh, yeah, yeah. So don't stuff. touch those files. <laughs> I'm not going to touch those files. <laughs> I'm honestly like it's. Uh, I'm a little bit terrified of touching anything in production now. <laughs> so uh, because you know there there was a day back when it was like things were on one server and it had a command line and I could log in, but now it's like, everything is so, I don't know, like it's so perfectly working and spread out and, and organized. And I just feel like if I, t if I do the wrong thing, it's just all going to, you know, <laughs> fall apart. I feel that way sometimes too. Yeah. <sighs> well, do you yeah, want good work. Like we, we didn't really have, I mean, we had a couple, like a, uh, in the pen test, we had a couple little, a couple things, a couple little things, a couple bigger things, but it wasn't like, just a hundred pages of like disaster. Yeah, it was actually yeah. like, I was like, okay, this is not that the end of the world. Like this is okay. Mm -hmm. So, so good work. Cause I know that doesn't just happen. Like I'm sure those, I'm sure those PHPBB people would have had much worse pen tests. <laughs> no doubt. Is there anything else y'all want to talk about or you want to wrap it up? I was just going to say, um, do you know what the, the best feature of the Whirly board is though? 
Oh, what is it? It's that you can stand. You can kind of stand with it. You know, like cool. Oh, like you're that. all when yeah. you're not on it, yeah. you can kind of just like you know nonchalantly hold it, kind of stand on one foot, look really cool while you're while you're podcasting. So it's like you bought the gold package of your student photos in the '90s. <laughs> we need to we need to have custom screen printing done on those things. They do. They do. Um, yeah. You can get your yeah. logo on them. So we should have a honey badger one. Although I don't know, totally. I don't think you can do the full graphic, but I should totally email the guy and, uh, and ask if, if there's anything we could do. Cause that would be sweet. Yeah, be there's some something spike. like, there's yeah. something delightfully sort of metaphorical about like advertising your like error monitoring product on this like board where you're like precariously balancing. Uh-huh. And if you like lose focus for one second, you'll just fall down and break your ankle. We might need to like, include some kind of liability waiver <laughs> with this swag, I, I imagine. Well, no, I mean, we, we are, I don't know, like we, we are in the EU, Josh. So we have to be able to say that, you know, if you fall off, you have the right to sue us oh. and the obligation to sue us. And we um, basically have the obligation <laughs> to give you what you want. Yeah. Well, we'll maybe we can put it in our uh, privacy policies or something or, well, I don't know what it would be. Our terms of service. Terms of use. If you, you if you get use. our swag, it's it's on you. It's on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally in the case of a shirt. <laughs> okay, so we need to wrap this up because that was a terrible joke, and they're just getting worse. <laughs> All right, this has been Founder Quest. Um, if you want to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, go for it. We love those. And if you want to write for us, I am still you know talking to writers and doing that thing. Um, go to our blog at honeybadger.io um, forward slash blog and look for the write for us link at the top. And that's it. See you guys later. Founder Quest is a weekly podcast by the founders of Honey Badger. Zero instrumentation, 360 degree coverage of errors, outages, and service degradations for your web apps. If you have a web app, you need it. Available at honeybadger.io. Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word, where you can access our huge back catalog of episodes. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week. <laughs>